All right, so I'm going to ask you if you can to uh, take your seat because we're going to start again. Uh, we run a tight ship here on trying to keep on schedule. <laughs> So uh, as we begin, I, I want to uh, thank General Wilson for joining us. Uh, a little bit of background on him. He is a command pilot with more than 4,500 flying hours and 680 combat hours uh, supporting operations, Iraqi freedom, enduring freedom, and combined Joint Task Force Horn of Africa. Prior to his current assignment as Vice Chief of Staff of the Air Force, he was Deputy Commander of U.S. Strategic Command. So he brings a very diverse set of experiences to the table, and so I want to use that as a way of um, opening up with the first question where I'd like to ask you to take the long view. What will be the same and what will be different in air warfare 10 years out. So it's 2028. What is the same? What is different? Yeah, hey, Peter, maybe I even sw switch the question a little bit and say it's going to be bigger than air warfare. So I think, you know, the, the general nature and, and, uh, of war in many, many ways won't change, but I think fundamentally uh, the nature of war will change in, in uh, exponential ways. And let me ar articulate just a second. So I think the, you've heard us talk about trans-regional, multi-domain, multi-component, both urban and connected, and speed is what's going to be different. I talk about today being a, a transformative time for our nation, uh, that we're going through a period of uh, disruption politically, economically, socially, and technologically, and that's happening globally. Any one of those areas are tough, but when you combine all four of those together, I think it makes for exponential disruption. Leading that on the bottom is this technological piece that we've seen this pace of change that's just going nearly vertical. Right? And, and you just you know, look uh, today, what's happening, 5G wireless, you connect the devices. We think there's, you know, in the neighborhood of 30 billion connected devices. That changes lots of things. So what I used to say is, or say is in the industrial age, uh, we won uh, industrial age speed, won yesterday's war, digital age speed, won tomorrow's war. And that's what actually the Air Force is really pretty good about, speed. We say speed wins, and whether it's speed of delivery of relief supplies after a hurricane or, or whether we're protecting the homeland, uh, owning the high ground of air and space, or projecting combat power forward, speed in training, speed in preparation, speed in developing capabilities, uh, speed wins. Uh, so I, what I see changing is, is those multi-domain, multi-component, urban and connected, uh, trans-regional, fights that are going to happen, and it won't just be an air piece. We'll be connected to all those. So one of the aspects that speed drives is a push to a topic that we've already hit on in a couple of panels today, and we're definitely going to hit on others, is machine learning, artificial intelligence. The idea that the machine can take in more information and or make a decision quicker than the human can. And we've seen that in everything from stock markets to it's being explored in uh, warfare. Uh, and I want to pull that thread a little bit further and connect it to work that we've had going on here at New America and um, our Digi China, sorry, our Digi China and Eastern Arsenal projects that look at the fact that artificial intelligence is a key new area for the economy, a key new area for war, but the United States has competitors in it, and in particular, uh, China's have been doing a huge amount of work. So what do you see as the applications for AI within the Air Force? And then secondly, what are you doing to make sure that you keep pace or don't fall behind or stay ahead, however you want to frame it? What do you do with the fact that we have a competitor in a way that we haven't seen in the last generation technologically when it comes to AI? Yeah. Well, we're, we're, we'd say there certainly are the competitors out there. Uh, we talk frequently with Eric Smith and the Defense Innovation Board as they come and tell us the things that they're doing and look at what we're doing. They're helping us. Uh, one, one example is Project Maven. So to set the record straight, what we're doing with Project Maven is we're trying to take um, things that are, that are routine, uh, the processing of pictures, and how can I do that better? And Eric would tell me, you, you may have an intel analyst, and after some period of time of training, he, can, he or she can get it right 75% of the time. He said, I have average computers that can look through 1,000 pictures a minute with 99% accuracy. So how could, I, how could I leverage this human machine teaming 
and let computers do what computers are good at and let humans do what humans are good at and then to figure out the insights and the why and the analysis versus repetitive tasks that, that I have people uh, joining on today about. But it is, uh, make no de 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 debate on this, this uh, where, where artificial intelligence is, is heading. Uh, so I've been traveling around, listening to some folks, uh, going to some of our great academia universities. Was out at Carnegie Mellon recently and seeing some of the work that they're doing, uh, seeing what our industry partners are doing. But I think it's going to take all of us working together across academia, across the industry, across the departments, across all the national labs and FFRDCs and bringing that together in this competition with AI because that's in fact what, our, what uh, China's doing. So if you look at what... Uh, Companies like Alibaba or Beidou or uh, Tencent are doing, they're investing a lot of money. And they're using a whole of nation approach for it. Right? So we're going to have to compete to win. And that, again, that's where I think we can come together across the, the different areas, bring those together to, to stay in the lead in artificial intelligence and machine learning. In your career, did you ever have to deal with an adversary that had better technology? I haven't. Uh, now, I'd tell you that I've, we've got Adversaries today that can take, you know, um, technology that we wouldn't normally think about as being uh, cutting edge and do and do things with it and adapt it in ways that we we didn't expect. And I'll use an example from a couple years ago when I was visiting my counterpart in Canada, and I had a, an assignment there. We were catching up about kids, and he said his son was going to college in King's College and he was getting a degree in, in mechanical engineering, but he goes, he's not really interested in that. He's really interested in FPV. I said, I, what is that? I don't know what you're talking about. He said, well, it's first person view. And I said, okay, I still don't know what you're talking about. He goes, oh, it's where kids, it's a rage on college campuses where kids are putting on augmented reality headsets and they're racing their, their UAVs. So while they're in this dorm room, they're racing their UAVs in the auditorium. Well, I started Googling it and it blew my mind what's going on. Well, that today is a transition to the Middle East, right? And so now that's what people like ISIS do today. They don't have to buy an a MQ-1 or an MQ-9. They can buy a DJI Phantom 4 made in China, which has got a 4K resolution camera, and they can use it to command and control. They can use it to, to do things that we didn't think, didn't think like that, and it's a $1,000 piece of equipment. Right, so that's where, this is another, what I call the quadruple convergence. Right, so we've got this technology that can make capability with global access and often can be put in hands of malicious intent. And so that's where we have to think differently about this challenge going forward. I want to connect uh, two things you brought up. So we, we talked about AI, and then you mentioned the difference between MQ1, MQ9, and an important moment happened in kind of future of war history this last year. So we saw the retirement of the MQ-1, the, you know, we poured one out for the Predator drone uh, and we moved to MQ-9. What is the future of what the Air Force um, lovingly calls RPAs, what the rest of us call drones? What does it look like when it comes to autonomy? And to uh, maybe make it a little bit more pointed, uh, General McConville from the Army side earlier today told us that a human will always be in the loop. What does in the loop look like for the Air Force in the future when it comes to RPA, UAS, drone, whatever we want to call it? Where is the human role? What are they doing? Flesh out what it means to be in the loop. Yeah, so we're, we're exploring with our research lab what that looks like in uh, autonomous uh, operations. And does that mean uh, one individual is now uh, controlling three or four or five or some number of autonomous vehicles rather than just one, or a couple people controlling just one. So how do we take this, again, human-machine teaming? How can we do things uh, to where um, I can take advantage of autonomous systems that can help sense and report back? And again, I, I'm going through my little uh, mindset of what the future looks like, and I think it looks a little bit like this. There's certainly a data aspect piece of this, and I think you know, we all would agree maybe that data is the new oil of the 21st century. But with that data, I gotta be able to have the right algorithms to connect the data uh, under, and understand the data to a network. Uh, I think the clouds are part of this. 
And I think compute on the edge is a part of this. And how do I do enhanced capabilities on the edge so that I don't have to have big pipes everywhere? But I think that this, as we look at that network that connects cloud to edge, that connects the data and the algorithms, that's where we're, we're now looking at how we do that, how do we rapidly experiment and prototype uh, with capabilities using, the, using those attributes moving forward. So I want you to um, do a little bit of imagineering for us. So you laid out a vision for the future Air Force, cloud, computing on the edge and the like. What does an adversary do in response to that? So you know, we, we develop a uh, long range strike, they develop uh, surface to air missiles. You know, there's always the back and forth. Mm -hmm. What do you expect the counters to be to the future Air Force that you're building? Yeah, so we, 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 I need to have an agile, uh, network to be able to, you know, we, we're putting a lot of emphasis. You've heard General Goldfein talk about uh, multi-domain operations uh, and how do I build a next generation OODA loop, the OODA loop 2.0 that is able to sense globally, understand uh, uh, the situation and then provide effects uh, across multiple domains at, at time and scale and place that our adversaries can't keep up with. Um, so with that, I need to build a network that, that connects the, from geosynchronous uh, orbit all the way to subsurface, uh, all of our different platforms. Um, so here's a, here's a vision that I, I think about. Uh, you, we see people driving Teslas. Every Tesla is networked to every other Tesla. So if a Tesla is driven on the road in front of you and hits a pothole, you know that that pothole is there. And if the Tesla is in the auto mode, it will avoid that pothole. If it's in the self-driving mode, it will actually adjust the suspension on the car to take into account that pothole. Well, if I can do that for a Tesla, then could I do that for, let's say, maybe a tank, an MRAP, a Humvee, a ground vehicle? If I can do it there, can I do that same thing in the air? Can I connect all the air vehicles so that they're passing information, relevant information about threat, adversary, and build an operating learning system? Can I do that same thing in space? And then can I connect space to air, to ground, to surface, to subsurface? So having a resilient network that's sharing information uh, is, is what we're going to try and drive to, because I think the, an adversary is going to try and deny us information. Or so something maybe we talked about at dinner last night, when we start doubting the, the truthfulness, the trust of the information, and it, it puts the fog and friction in there, weaponizing that information to make sure so you know what truth is will be important in the future. Mm -hmm. So you brought up space. What is the space environment, space domain? What do battles look like? What does the Air Force look like in 2028 when it comes to space? What is it doing? Who's in charge? How is it training for it? Yeah, great points. So we're having lots of space discussions uh, uh, across the nation. What I, what I think is really healthy about it is we're all in alignment. From the White House to Congress to, to the OSD, joint staff, uh, allies, partners, industry, about uh, we have the, 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 our space force today is the envy of the world. Right? The United States Air Force is responsible for 90% of that. But we also know our adversaries have also seen that and seen that space is essential for any joint warfight, whether it be indications of warning, whether it be missile alert, whether it be communication, whether it be uh, GPS, down the list of capabilities that it provides our nation. So we need to be able to defend space. So space is a contested domain, and we need to, A, understand that, and then look at how would, how would I provide the capabilities in the past where we, it, it wasn't, right? So I, I don't want to go to space, but I also need to have the ability to defend my assets in space. So we're going to build a force that does just that. We're looking at everything from the Bottom end, how do I train space operators? And General Jay Raymond out of Space Command is working really hard on basing, uh, building this space uh, mission force that, that uh, understands the environment and is able to think war fighting uh, through, through uh, the buildup of our operators. And the, the other part is how do we acquire space capabilities faster? Lots of effort in that endeavor from the, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, uh, keen interest in how do I Again, build capabilities faster. How do I partner with industry? How do I push down milestone decision authorities? How do I use things like other transactional authorities? How do I do things 
like we've done in, in the, the rapid capabilities office for space, to, again, to bring on space capabilities much faster. So that's what we're doing. We're, we're building a defendable architecture. Uh, certainly industry, uh, commercial, our allies and partners are a part of this. Uh, but the other key part of this is how essential space is to all of us in the joint warfight. So I'm going I'm to tug at this a little bit more. I'm not going to let you get away with this. So in 2028, what does the US uh, satellite architecture look like? Is it lots of small, cheap satellites, or is it a small number of capable, exquisite ones? Yeah, and Peter, I tell you, it's, it's, it's maybe both. I mean, we're looking through that right Can now. Can we afford both? Good. Um, maybe. And again, <laughs> here's, here, here's, here, here's the maybe part of that, right? It's, 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 are you designing something to last for 20 years, or are you designing something to last for five years? Uh, and there's a big price point difference in how you do that. So if we're in 2028, we've got to make that decision we're, now. We're, so which, we're, which do we we're, do? We're starting the well. We're 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 working through understanding that and getting uh, buy-in and consensus across our uh, uh, all our different departments on what that exactly looks like. Mm -hmm. And I think there'll be a, a, a mixture of both. I think we'll uh, again look at what uh, commercials look doing today and the, the different companies that are uh, going to do a internet you know, thousand constellation uh, internet. Uh, we need to be part of that. Look at what folks like Planet Lab are doing. They're doing things differently with small sats, right? I think we'll be part of that. I also think capabilities to do some of the things that we need to do aren't going to be like that. They're going to be bigger, more costly, and we're going to need to be able to protect and defend those. What is, so it's a combination of, probably of both. What does space warfare look like in 2028? Is it as now where I'm using assets in space to communicate or uh, look down? So it's part of the battle space, but there's no conflict there? Or in 2028, is there actual conflict there? And what does it look like? Is it, you know, is it, I'll, I'll let you fill in yeah. the blanks. So, you know, you probably heard General John Hyden. I think he's got a great answer to this. He goes, there's no such thing as space war. There's war, right? And an adversary is going to try and deny us the capabilities that we're going to rely on to, uh, to be able to win. And the joint team, the joint force needs to have Space is a big part of that equation today on, on what we do globally and to be able to do the things that I talked about earlier on a global scale, I need to be able to have the ability to sense, observe, act and decide on a time and uh, scale faster than our adversaries and that today that requires space. Uh, and everything from, like, like I said, from GPS for our precision navigation and timing to our communication to our sensing, it's gonna require space. So uh, what does it look like? We well, have to be able to protect it, defend it, and we have to be able to deter in space. Um, so that, that, the, that, that there's no real easy answer on this. What does it look like? I think that any adversary is going to look at how re reliant we are on our capabilities and try and affect that. And that's why we're working hard to defend space uh, is one of the big efforts moving forward. So let's go nuclear. It's 2028. <laughs> What does the B-21, I don't want to ask what it looks like, what does the B-21 program look like at that point 10 years out from now? 10 years out from now, we've, uh, we'll have taken delivery of our, of our first um, uh, models there. We'll be producing them, at a, hopefully at a, uh, a nice clip. Uh, two years after the initial operating capability of the airplane, we will have nuclear certified it, and so we'll have a capability to have a a dual capable platform in our, our B-21. I just went out uh, with the Secretary, Deputy Secretary of Defense and the Northrop team and we did a you know, one day deep dive on the B-21 and we're in the preliminary design phase and it's coming along very well, we think. Uh, we've got a good team, uh, both government and industry on this program. It's really important to all of us. Uh, so we're, we're spending time really deep diving in, in Secretary Shanahan wanted to, uh, to go out and, and get a, an immersion in that, and that's what we did. We're needing to balance that, though, and I just, you know, because I always get asked the question about the transparency on the B-21. Uh, and I want to make sure that we're as transparent as we can possibly be with those cleared members of Congress and, and their staff who we, we uh, have shown all the details on the B-21. We're balancing that with making sure our adversaries don't learn things in advance of what we're trying to uh, for operational security to, to not let them know. And so that's where the balance becomes on the B-21. Okay. 
So the general has been uh, very kind to agree to do something a little bit different, which is we're now going to have a Twitter lightning round. Uh, and basically this weekend, I let social media know that uh, I would be interviewing him and ask for questions from them. So uh, we've got a series of questions, and he's agreed to give answers in uh, 200. Less than 280 words. It, it, not, no, not words, characters. <laughs> Character, big characters, difference characters, here. characters, right. Uh, it's, it's Twitter, not um, Facebook, <laughs> that we've learned. You know, uh, Only a couple of old people will read. Yeah. Um, OK, so first question is from uh, at Dan Suckman, which is, what is the future of CAS? What is the future of CAS? Close air support. Close air support. Uh, I, I think it, it's, um, uh, it's an important mission set for our Air Force. We're going to continue to be invested in uh, making sure we can protect our, uh, our ground forces. We it's kind of a moral obligation for us to be able to do that. We also have to be able to do it both contested all the way through uncontested all the way through contested. And so we're developing capabilities that do just that. I'll use this. Um, so it's important to us. Sorry, 20, 280 characters are so, way so too long. You, you, yeah. you say CAS is important C Cass and is it's got to work contested and uncontested. Yes. Hashtag Air Force. Hashtag Air Force. <laughs> you know, like, I got it now. Okay. I'm on track now. Got it. Short answers, 280 characters. Important. Okay, so but the takeaway on that is contested and uncontested. Okay, so next one is from at Roly Poliolis, what kind of changes, if any, are needed to Air Force spending and acquisitions, both in process and priorities? We need to change uh, how we do requirements, how we do acquisition, contracting, budgeting, and testing. Speed wins. I got to compress the timeline. Hashtag. Speed wins. All right. Um, at KW Collins, should there be a separate Space Force? Why or why not? More to follow. <laughs> so we think we have a good, uh, the world's greatest Space Force today. We're going to make it even better. OK. Uh, similar one from at Fleischer underscore P. What kind of new space assets should the U.S. develop to counter China and Russia? What kind of new space assets? We need to have defendable space assets uh, and a resilient architecture that can uh, continue to make sure we dominate in space in 2028. Okay, this was my personal favorite of all of them. Um, at KJ Deggs. Will the Air Force ever replace ellipticals and vending machines with enough squat racks to actually get a leg day in? Or is the Air Force all doomed to chicken legs at the base gym? I think he's so talking about my legs. He's seen me at the gym, my right? chicken legs. <laughs> Change chicken legs, note. OK, so at, at, it's, it's clearly an Air Force officer. All right, OK, at J Byerly 81 as, oh. as other nations uh, sorry, as other countries invest in AI and drone development to increase the speed at which decisions are made, how will the U.S. Air Force keep pace? Yeah, we're going to not only keep pace, but dominate in how we do that. It's going to take a whole of government approach to this. Industry, academia, national labs, and our department working together. Hashtag speed wins. Okay. Um, we've got some tough questions here. At Joe Plins uh, sorry, Plinsler. Why did U.S. Air Force leadership severely limit press engagement? What responsibilities do service chiefs have to communicate with taxpayers? Yeah, we, we want to be uh, transparent as we possibly can with the American public. We did not limit communication. What we wanted to do is make sure all of our folks understand operational security and making sure we're not giving, giving uh, adversaries uh, advantages that they don't need to have. Okay. At Frantic Goat, the U.S. Air Force and the ANG have evaluated A-29 and or the AT-6C nearly half a dozen times in the past decade. How can the U.S. Air Force need more data before deciding how to proceed on its latest light attack program? Yeah. So we're doing an exercise this summer with uh, both airplanes. We want to understand uh, the maintenance required, the number of people required, the support logistics infrastructure to be able to do that 
and, and then we think we'll be able to make a decision in the fall to take a, a program that would normally take years to buy and from idea to, to buy in an airplane under three years. Hashtag speed wins. <laughs> All right. Um, F. Fletch Williams, how is contracting to private companies balanced with maintaining appropriate national security checks and limitations to information access? Yeah. Um, we need to look hard at how we do uh, uh, getting the right access for the right people at the right time, but also this operational security piece behind that. We've had lots of challenges with lots of clear defense contractors that uh, information is, has gotten out. It's, that's got to change. We've got to figure out how we do that differently. Okay. So let's take it from cyberspace back to um, human or meat space, and uh, we're going to take questions from here. So please raise your hand, wait for the mic to come, and identify yourself. Right there. No, no, no. Right, literally right there. Yeah. Hi. Hi, General Wilson. This is Oriana Pollock from military.com. Um, thanks for doing this. Um, I wanted to see if you had any uh, comments regarding the uh, hike in uh, aviation accidents, uh, the report that's out there from Military Times this morning. Um, you know, talking about the future, talking about readiness, but what about the right now, that the spike has been seen, that there has been some, you know, grave indifference on, on what's been going on out there in, in aviation? I mean, could you comment regarding what the Air Force's portion of that is and how you plan to build up that readiness so you know fatal accidents do not occur. Yeah. Well, let me uh, set the record straight. Any, any accident and any Class A accident uh, is one too many. And we, we spend a lot of time making sure that we have the safest program that we possibly can. For those who don't know, when we, when we talk Class A's, we talk as a dollar figure or a loss of life. So our safest year. Uh, ever was 2014. 2017 was our second safest year. So our Class A mishaps have been trending down. Uh, what's been trending up and was reported was our Class C mishaps. And those are uh, lower category uh, mishaps, and lower dollar figure, but still a concern to all of us. And so we've got our safety professionals digging into it, seeing if there's any noticeable trends that we have uh, in, in our Class C mishap rates. Uh, but, but to your broader question of readiness, we're intensely focused on improving readiness. We brought together a team uh, of about 50 people. We sequestered them in the Pentagon for six weeks, and we looked at readiness through the lens of what can we do to drive the readiness of the Air Force faster uh, and move the timeline left. I used to say, how long does it take to make an eight-year Master Sergeant? And that's about how long it's going to take us to improve our readiness. We think we can do it faster. We're going to look at how do we target uh, specific squadrons with the right both people, with the right experience mix, with the right uh, flying hours and infrastructure to be able to support pacing squadrons to, to, to move the readiness needle left. Uh, but we've had a, a very big team looking at it. We've uh, briefed it up to the leadership. Uh, I think they are all really can see the efforts that we're making and, and have been a, uh, like the, the trajectory that we're on to improve our readiness. Okay, so we got the middle. Let's go to the left here uh, in the front right here. Thank you, Patrick Tucker with Defense One. Um, the pushback from the Google developer community about the Project Maven partnership has certainly caught Google off guard. I wonder if you could tell us um, what's the most important lesson learned for the Air Force from that uh, now very public pushback, and has it affected uh, the way the Air Force is working Project Maven, and has it affected any potential future partnerships with Google or similar firms? Yeah, I guess the lesson learned is to make sure we're, we're all understand the right side picture. This is, we're using, uh, it's a department effort with OSD, which the Air Force is a part of, to be able to look at how do we automate things that the uh, repetitive task that humans spend a lot of times doing that, that machine learning can do differently. So today we're looking at how do I look through full motion video and be able to determine is that a car, is that a person, is that a house, uh, and that's what the, the Project Maven effort is in doing. To be able then to turn around and say, make sure that people understand what it's not. Right? It is not weaponizing. Uh, it's not uh, use, using machines in a targeting function. We're fully compliant with all the US regulations, policies, and laws, and that we've had industry partnered with us uh, moving forward. Uh, and, and we continue. We're going to need industry. All of us are going to need industry to help us uh, moving forward as we 
again, compete, deter, win on this new national defense strategy. And, and our industry partners have been very helpful in this. We, so uh, uh, bottom line learned is communication uh, and being able to, uh, people to understand the message of what exactly we're trying to do moving forward. Is there someone on the right here? Anyone? Yeah, right there. I'm uh, Mike Kingram, I'm a defense fellow with Congressman Rob Bishop. Sir, we talked a lot about in 2028 about systems we'll bring online to, to face our adversaries, but what about talent management, making sure we're recruiting the right people, retaining the right people in a very competitive job market who have very marketable skills to be able to fight our wars in 2028? Yeah, that's a really important question. We're all in this hunt for talent, every one of us. And so we have to find ways to reduce the barriers from people. That, you know, you see them like I do. I get to go out and meet these folks, our young uh, people that are just simply amazing, right? So I got to find a way to make it easy for them to come into service and then to be able to, to, to trans have this transportability through the different services or agencies who want to be part of it. Uh, I was telling a story backstage uh, when I'll call the four great captains. Here's an example. So uh, at our squadron officer school, the commandant asked for a shark tank-like uh, shark tank -like event with ideas. And he said, the best idea will get to the chief of staff of the Air Force. Unfortunately, the chief was gone that day, and I got to listen to their idea. First of all, their idea was unbelievable. It's today, I'm going to go visit here at the end of the week. They're up in Boston doing a tech accelerator to help us on a really challenging problem set. I called them the four great captains. Here's an example of one of the captains. Uh, and they were all of this caliber. He got his degree from Rensselaer Polytech. He then went to the Air Force Nuclear Weapons Center. They recognized his talent. They sent him to MIT to get his PhD. While he was at MIT getting his PhD, he got his MBA from Harvard on the side. And while he did that, he set up a venture capital company that was named as one of the top 100 venture capital companies in America. These four captains were spending 50 hours a week in their spare time on this problem because they were really passionate about doing this and fixing a problem. Right? I got to unleash that talent that exists all over. I, and and I, what I've seen is, is these, these young people at all these universities, they've got, they've got energy and passion. They want to make a difference. So I've got to find a way to make it easy for them to come in and serve. And then based on their life conditions and what's going on, they may need to take a break and go do something else. But then I've got to make it really easy for them to come back in. And, and this, this is a really important question for the whole government. right? How do we do this so we reduce the barriers for entry and then how do we make it easy so people who want to serve can serve? So in these examples where there's a, a shark tank or there's um, something really interesting that comes out of one of the war fighting labs or the like, the story that then's often told is really cool idea and then it died somewhere along the valley of death. What changes need to happen? There's obviously policy changes that you can undertake, yeah. but there's also legal changes. There's a need for legislation. What are the types of legislation or legal changes that you see are needed to make more of these innovative ideas survive the valley of death and become programs of record? Yeah. So here's an example. So as we do the typical uh, requirements process now, and I sit on the, on the JROC with General Selva, who chairs it, we go through a process, and I'm going to call it the capability-based assessment to initial capabilities document to analysis alternatives to a uh, CDD before I get a milestone decision on a program, right? That time period can take years, right? In many cases, five to eight years to go through that piece, right? Way too long, right? So I've got to be able to, to take, to do an uh, experiment to a rapid prototype to say, is that good enough? And can I make a milestone decision here to move forward? And so I'd say it's almost going back to what we used to do in the late 50s and the 60s with the Century Series fighters. Of our, how, can I, how can I put out capability, different capability that's modified every three to five years with a, a pipeline and an industrial base behind that? We haven't been doing that. Right? So we, we, I think we have to get back to that on the requirements piece where we have to change it. We also have to change how we do the acquisition piece. And we got lots of people focused on that. We haven't hit the contracting piece, right? I can't take two years to get something on contract. I can't take four or five years to test something, 
right? It will be obsolete before it's fielded because at the end of that, I put it in the hands of somebody who can do something with it and I gotta train the operators, right? And so I've gotta get on this pace and scale of capability development and go from what we've currently been doing for the last you know, 20 plus years and shrink that down to a, a timeline that's one quarter uh, that what, what we've been doing in the past. Okay. Let's give someone in the back a chance to ask a question. Yeah, right there in the white. Hi, General Wilson. Uh, Rachel Karras with Inside the Air Force. Um, so the Air Force recently said that it's looking at keeping the U-2 until 2100. Um, and you're also, you know, working on ways to keep... Sorry, to be clear, yeah, 2100 like a century from now? Correct. That's we make sure keeping the B-52? No, the U-2. U-2. Yeah, Dragon Lady. Um, but you're also looking at ways to keep the RQ-4 on par with that. Um, so I'm curious, now that you're looking at slepping Global Hawk, are you trying to keep them on the same timeline? You know, what is your plan for Global Hawk as that whole sort of high altitude enterprise moves forward? Yeah, so I, I don't know if anybody's ever come online and saying we're keeping the U-2 till 2100. I, I certainly haven't. Uh, what, we, what we do think is that we need this high altitude capacity both from the uh, RQ-4 and the uh, U-2 today, and so can I, uh, it's a capacity issue. So I need both of them to do the type of things uh, to be able to provide the information they provide on a global scale. So we're trying to get the sensors right between uh, each different platform. Uh, we've got lots of service life left on the U2, and we, we certainly have got plenty of service life left on the uh, RQ4. Uh, but I think it's a capacity issue of which we need both. Okay, let's get a couple more questions right here. And in, in between, I, I really want to know the conflict scenarios in the year 2100. You know, is, will the U2 be operating against the Arturi <laughs> Empire and the like? Um, so. Hi. So my question is, how do you deal with the ethics of autonomous weapons? Well, it's it, all of us. I think something we need to be thinking through. Right? I, I, I'm, if, the, if the Army Vice Chief said it, I'll probably be the guy that repeats it, that we think there's a human in the loop on all things. We're not going to have autonomous weapons where we say, just go do what you, but I think we need to think through that question that you just asked about how much autonomy, uh, where do we provide the autonomy, but make no mistake that the, the, the world, um, in the world that we're moving in, in the world that the, 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 this transformation is happening in technology, artificial intelligence and machine learning will be a key part of lots of things that we do. It's, in, it's impacting every part of our life um, and certainly impacting us here in the military. So how do, we, how do we do, again, what machines are really good at? How do I team with humans, what, what humans are really good at? How do I keep a person in the loop and, and define what is in the loop uh, and to provide the, again, to me it's the insights and the understanding and the, and the why and, and the, for the what that machines can help provide us with. But it's an important question I think we all need to be thinking through. Can, I, I want to pin you down a little bit more on this. In the, in the human in the loop, say in air-to-air um, -air combat, is the human, human decision-making to shoot or not the way it is with RPA operations right now where the plane may be able to operate in some way, shape, or form on its own, but it's gonna be the human deciding to pull the trigger or not. Or is it the way we do, for example, air defense, where there is the potential for the machine to operate, identify, and the like, and the human can veto it, but it will operate without them? Which is, which is it? Because the human is in the loop in both, yeah. but they're So they're I, I, I think we'll have to learn both ways, and we'll have to experiment both ways, and what that means, and it, you know, just as you use as an air defense uh, capability, where there's, there's things that we have to have, you know, to, are they, there's a set of rules of engagement. Are they squawking the appropriate squawk? Are they on the right altitude? Are they in the right corridor? Are they doing this? If not, somebody's there to veto it, right? So there'll, there'll be a, a series of rules of engagement that we'll have to be able to follow and understand on both sides of that equation moving forward. Can, given the emphasis you earlier had on speed, can a human stay within that OODA loop 2.0, or will it definitionally be inhuman? We don't know. We're going we're to all understand as we start to do more 
experimenting, prototyping, and understanding that exact okay. question. We've got time for um, uh, one last question, and I'm going to abuse it by um, asking one more, <laughs> uh, but hopefully be a useful one for all of you. What scenario keeps you up at night? <laughs> People, I sleep like a baby, <laughs> OK? <laughs> so uh, I, I would say we're taking the, the General Mattis approach. OK, when, when you wake up in the morning and go. I'm, I'm keeping the General Mattis approach. <laughs> I want our adversaries to stay up at night thinking about what we're doing. Right? That's what I want to have happen. There's a couple areas that I think that, uh, that I need to sharpen the focus maybe on, uh, maybe two or three. Uh, one is we talk about moral obligations of our Air Force, that I got to be able to provide the right uh, organization, training, equipment, and leadership for any of our young uh, airmen that we send forward. Right? That they, that, that our job is to equip them to be able to do their mission and that they're well led on that mission. So that to be able to do that across the range of capabilities that, that our Air Force has is a moral imperative for us. The second piece is uh, to this question over here is about talent management. We've got some incredible people today. Uh, and so you've heard our Secretary of the Air Force and our Chief talk about how do we empower them? How do we remove the barriers and the obstacles for their success uh, so that they, you know, we have this little simple little uh, model that I go through in my mind. We start with really good people. We then make sure they got the right education training experience. They're confident and proud of what they do. They're personally and professionally fulfilled. And when we do that, we get mission success. And if I remove any one of those pieces uh, than that, then people invariably will not uh, continue to serve. So I got to do all those pieces so that we've got uh, the right talent moving our Air Force forward. And I contend, you know, we're, we've got a big study going away that I didn't talk about that, that talks, uh, it's an S&T review. But what we want is our Air Force to be the thought leaders for future conflict so that we can deter, uh, uh, compete, deter, and win in any future fight. And so developing those thought leaders uh, for our nation who are going to help us in these future fights is really important. Uh, and that's, we've got a lot of efforts and focus on how do we do that and how do we do that better. So I want to thank you for a couple of things. The first is for in a time of uh, where there's controversy over engagement between uh, civilian military, media military, you've sat down and taken uh, roughly 40 questions from us uh, and 40 um, tough questions on everything from future of war to Air Force gyms. Uh, so we deeply appreciate that, but we also appreciate the way that you've injected um, a lot of uh, key issues for us to chew on, both in the conference ahead, but also the year ahead in this program. So please do join me in a round of applause. Thank you.